in some ways, talking about how to head ref a game is a little out of my self-imposed remit for ref ed. But then I recalled the first time I had ref the game, and it started to change my mind a little bit. The term blindsided comes to mind. It was also my first year refing Derby. Before we begin, however, I'd like to give you some fair warning. This presentation is not the official word from the WFTDA or MRDA. I am a level 4 referee with the WFTDA, but I am not working for them, and this has no official approval from them. I'm just a guy who wants to help out. And like anything that doesn't come with a WFTDA or MRDA seal of approval, take with an appropriate level of salt. In an effort to keep this presentation as correct as possible, I'm including the date that this presentation was recorded. In the event that I need to update the presentation due to something that was clarified or just out and out wrong, this date will change and there will be an update in the change log that's listed with the presentation on refed.com. The original presentation was recorded on September 4th, 2016. There were updates made on July 15th, 2017 to account for the updated rule set. I arrived at the venue pretty early. It's a habit I picked up from a not very distinguished acting career, but one I've kept. It gets my head focused on what I need to do. Once another person from the crew arrived, we said our hellos and whatnot, and he casually mentioned, So, you're head refing tonight. Followed by my, uh, not that I've been told. Other people wandered in, said the same thing. Apparently, I was head refing, and everyone knew it going into that game but me. Surprise! Given that a lot of us get put into this position without a lot of training, although hopefully a little more warning, I think upon reflection that this does fall into my self-imposed remit. This session won't be the definitive how-to on being a head referee. It can't be any more than a give you the basics of what you need to know. Each referee has their own styles, and the more you do it, the more you'll develop yours. The trick will be not to develop bad habits. So let's look at the duties that fall under the jurisdiction of the head referee. You're the primary contact point between teams and the rest of the crew. You perform captain's meetings and crew meetings. You administer official reviews. You administer expulsions. You determine forfeits. You determine if a final jam ended naturally. And you lead the referee crew. Let's start with being the primary point of contact between the teams and the officiating crew. Because if this doesn't go well, your game won't go well. You need to at least be able to fake being personable. And I say fake not in a bad sense. In my real life, I'm quiet and awkward. But before games, I put myself in a mental state where I can be the head referee. I treat it kind of like an acting situation. And the head referee is a role. I still do this. I mentally go through in my head how I need to carry myself how I want to process official reviews, captain's meetings, and deal with possibly angry people. The acting and improvisation classes I used to take in school and college still come into play, and if this is somewhere where you want to go, I'd recommend one or two. If nothing else, they're fun. At higher levels of play, it's very common for captains to have permission to talk to any referee. But those refs always have the ability to direct that person to the head referee. I think the number one thing to do in these situations is to always be understanding. You do not have to agree, but you always need to be willing to listen. When I head ref, I tell the other officials that I will always pass along issues from the captains, even if I don't agree with them, because despite my opinion, sometimes they're still right. And even if they're not, we can pay that extra attention to them. And when they come back saying that their issue still hasn't been addressed, we can honestly say that we tried, and maybe there's a difference in how we're seeing impact or something. This also helps because we're being honest to the captains. 
Some people are really good at lying to others, and despite my acting classes, I'm not. If I try to bullshit a captain, chances are they're going to know it. A good lie takes time to put together, both for the verbal lie and the adjustment of body language. Now, I'm pretty decent at improv, but I'm not that decent. Further, I don't want to lie. I got into this game because of my respect for the teams, the players, and the game. Why would I want to sully that with bullshit? Teams aren't expecting you to be on their side. They just want someone to listen, to pass along their concerns, and to take them seriously. Is there a limit? Sure there is. We have levels of decorum set in the rules, and it's also a good idea to have information from the captains be something that's actionable. A coach asking you to call anything isn't very helpful. Asking the coach to then articulate a pattern of missed calls protects your officials from potential abuse while letting the coach know that you will pass along requests as long as it's reasonable. Responding that we are calling things, they're just no calls, isn't really going to be helpful because even if it's true, it's flippant. I mentioned honesty a bit earlier, but I want to go back to it. Captains and coaches appreciate it, but you don't want to go as far as to sell out your crew. Saying, I'm sorry, none of us had eyes on the incident that you wanted us to look at is admitting a mistake. And if it happens, you should admit to it. But it's spread out over everyone, including you. Saying, Joe Blow the ref, and if there is a Joe Blow the ref, I don't mean you. I'm just coming up with a name. But saying Joe Blow the ref blew the call, well, may be accurate, but it's insulting, and honestly, it's not very helpful. We all screw up, and this doesn't help things. Teams can infer what they want when you say that there was a crew mistake. You don't want to make a habit of admitting mistakes, but then again, teams will know if you're trying to bullshit them. If there are a ton of mistakes, you may want to change tacts and try to tactfully explain the situation to the captains. At least the mistakes are not purposeful. Maybe the game is over the heads of the crew. If a ref is having a tough time during the game, I think it's probably okay to discreetly admit it. But you need to do so in a way that's not hanging that ref out to dry. Because we've all been there. And the last thing we need to have is a ref quit when there's room for improvement. It's a balancing act to be sure. But it's also a way to set realistic expectations. I had a game where I came in as a head ref where I knew none of the other referees. And one of the captains before the game expressed a strong concern about two of the officials' ability to referee the level of game they were going to be in. To me, it is reasonable to go over the options you have with staffing with those captains. Because as head referee, you can change the staffing. But that depends on what kind of bench you have to pull from which, and let's be honest here, is almost always none. At worst, your job becomes conflict resolution, where a team is extremely unhappy with a call above and beyond what can be done in an official review. This is where keeping your poise is a must. If someone comes in steaming mad, keeping a calm face, looking at them, and replying in slow, measured tones is essential. As a referee in these situations, you have three weapons. Your demeanor, a penalty to the captain, or an expulsion. An expulsion is only going to make things worse unless it appears to everyone else that the only person losing their shit is that other person. And they are beyond control. The kind of situation where everyone breathes a sigh of relief because of the ejection. Penalties for insubordination and misconduct are pretty straightforward in the rules, but if at all possible, they're coaxed out more gently as to not aggravate the situation. If a captain is flying off the handle to another referee and earns the insubordination for abusive language, it is perfectly acceptable to remind them that they're not allowed to talk that way to the official 
before actually giving them the penalty. The rules tell me I have to give you this penalty because you've crossed the line, not because I'm angry with you. To me, it's important to realize that while we're the head referee and for purposes of the game in charge, we're only in charge of that game. We're not in charge of the sport. And if we ever want a head referee again, we have to let the players who are in charge of the sport have their due respect too. But since we're in charge of the game, there's no reason for us to get angry or fly off the handle ourselves. It does us zero good. And most of the time sends the game to hell. So as long as the captain doesn't say anything where I'm required to issue a penalty, I let them have the last word. It doesn't affect the decisions I've made. And if it keeps things in line, then so much the better. I kind of wanted to go in the natural order of events, which would have been starting with the captains and officials meetings, but I felt like the setup of how to be the head ref from your presentation to conflict resolution applies to everything. But the captains and officials meetings are your first impressions, so it's important not to screw things up. It's actually pretty hard to screw these things up unless you try really hard. I'm in the school that says, the less I say in the captain's meetings, the better. I have a few things I talk about at every meeting, and that's it. The captains don't want a speech from me. If they have questions, they'll ask. These are the things that I always bring up. I remind teams that I have the same 30 seconds to deal with my issues that they do. So if I don't have time to talk to them, I will ask them to call a timeout or a review. I also frequently say that if they call a timeout to talk to me, they're entitled to a full 60 seconds of me time. That means if I have issues separate from them that require an official timeout, that OTO time won't eat into the team's timeout. I haven't run into this much, but on the few occasions where I've had to put this to the test, the captains do appreciate it because it is a respect towards them. If there was a new clarification, a new casebook entry, or some non-standard practice at the venue, I relay that to them. For my own venue, which has several non-standard practices, such as benches on the inside and a penalty box at turn one, I've started on a sheet that lists them all, and I send them to the captains and visiting officials ahead of time. I totally stole this idea from Major Wood in Nashville. Naming off captains and assistants, bench selection, and wristbands for the jammer referees and scorekeepers. Determining if helmet covers are acceptable. I added this a little while ago because I've seen an increasing number of complaints from teams about covers, so I've added this to cover my own butt. I ask teams, and if there's no initial objection or if a team doesn't bring their covers, to tell me before the start of the first jam if there's an issue. Beyond that, it's strictly captain's questions. Crew meetings are very similar. There's darn little you can do in a 5-10 to 10 minute meeting that's going to help someone be a good referee. So unless there's an issue that you know needs to be addressed, or issues from the captains, it doesn't need to come up. Going in with a laundry list is going to bore the officials, and they're going to forget it all anyway. Reminding them of one or two things works much better. Best to just make sure that everyone is there, they know what they're doing, and are familiar with any non-standard practices going on, or things out of the ordinary, such as the teams split apart last year, and there's a scheduled rumble after the game is over. The next big item for a head referee are official reviews. Now, I actually already did a presentation on official reviews, so I'm going to skip this section entirely and send you to that instead. Calling or recommending expulsions are really hard the first couple of times, then get easier as you go on. It's not unlike learning any other call as a referee eventually becomes more of a reflexive process rather than a cognitive one. I can't tell you if that's a good or bad thing. I suppose it depends on if you're the person being expelled or the person who is the victim of that expelled person. 
once you get the feel of that sweet baby Jesus moment, which is whatever you happen to say when you see something particularly heinous, it becomes less of, does this person deserve to be expelled as much as, should there be an EMT present, or should I recommend a suspension? In some ways, I feel the physical process of issuing an expulsion is pretty easy. The hard part is actually making the decision. In some ways, the process of that decision is much like an official review. You want to guide the conversation, have a person who wants the expulsion explain why, have another person explain why not, and keep everyone else on task so it doesn't take forever. Having had one person explain why the expulsion should be given doesn't mean the next person should have story time too. A simple, I agree, should be enough. But the physical process is pretty simple. Like with an official review, I tell the captains first. Blue 321 recklessly crashed into the red player's back. He had 30 feet to avoid it, never made any motion to do so. He's being expelled for an egregious back block. Again, like a review, you explain what you saw and the reason for the expulsion. When telling the skater of the expulsion, I usually go with a little less verbiage. Simply, Blue, 3 two, one you are being expelled for an egregious back block. Followed by the appropriate hand signals, in this case, the back block signal, and then the expulsion thumb. In both of these cases, don't get in into an argument or a protracted discussion with the captain or expelled player. To the captain, you can say we've had a discussion, and they're welcome to use an official review if there's something they think we missed. To the player, the discussion has been made and that this needs to go through their captain. The trick is when you have an expulsion recommendation from an incident that you didn't see. You are still the authority if the player is expelled or not, but you have to trust your officials. If it's an experienced official, chances are you're going to trust that official's judgment. If this is a new ref, then you need to judge that ref's ability with the possibility that other referees or NSOs saw that action. Myself, I don't like expelling someone without some corroboration, but there are areas on the track where there wouldn't be multiple people watching, such as outside the engagement zone in the back. There's a good example of this on the out of play penalties module. In which case, you make the best decision possible, and if you're lucky enough to have video and find the wrong decision being made, you contact the parties involved and issue apologies. Again, I'd rather be honest and admit a mistake than be bullheaded and prove an asshole. I'm going to merge judging a forfeit and unnatural jam endings because they're both pretty rare. Forfeits are pretty easy. The rules say that the head referee may declare that a team forfeits the game if they have five or fewer skaters eligible to play or if they refuse to play. So if a team refuses to take the track, it's a forfeit. However, if a team has five or fewer skaters, it's only may be a forfeit. I'm going to share a recent game where a team came into the game with six skaters. I had two criteria in my head for if I was going to have to call a forfeit. One was if the team felt they couldn't go on, and then the other was if I felt it was too dangerous to continue. They finished the game with three skaters, but they didn't go down to that until the last few jams. And I think by then it was a point of pride that they finished the game. And since it wasn't yet unsafe, I let them finish it. I think the idea behind saying that the head ref may call a forfeit at five or few skaters is that it allows us as head refs to start thinking about calling it. But again, it's not mandatory. Now granted, if a team started with 14 skaters and then went down to five, there may be a whole different feeling by that team if they want to continue or not. But there's nothing that says that you can't talk to the captains about those feelings and if they want to continue. One thing that the rules don't cover is if a team is just a no-show. In soccer, they make a difference between an abandoned game versus a terminated game. There's no difference in roller derby, but if the team just isn't there, 
I'd try to find out the reason why. Was it something unavoidable, like poor driving conditions? Did the team have an accident on the way over? Or was it just poor planning? I would get as much information as you can and send it in, in the event this is a sanctioned WFTDA game, to the game's review panel, as they might want to remove the forfeit label from the game. More common is the unnatural conclusion on the final jam of the game, and if another jam should be run. First, you can consider a jam to have ended unnaturally if it didn't run two minutes, and if the lead jammer didn't call it off. Officiating error? Technical malfunction? Interference by person or object is all open to an unnatural conclusion. But to run it again? It basically depends on if the team behind had a reasonable chance at tying or taking the lead in the time remaining. If a team was down by 60 when the jam ended, then probably not. If a team was down by 5 and there was a minute left on the jam clock, then yeah, have another jam. If a team was down by 5 but there were only 5 seconds left, well, where was the jammer at the call-off? Was she on a scoring pass or in the penalty box? Was there another jammer in the penalty box? All of that goes into if you feel like there was a reasonable chance of a change of outcome had the jam continued. Realize that one team or another is very possibly going to be unhappy, but again, like with an official review, explain how the decision was made. If the teams still aren't happy, they can contact the game's review panel for the WFTDA and contest it. Chances are you'll want to write down your explanation right away, just in case. Most of this module has been dealing with interactions between the teams and the head referee. And most of the time, that's the main function of the head referee. But you also have to run the referee crew. On a good, experienced crew, this is pretty easy. They know what they need, what you need, and understand what needs to happen to keep the game going smoothly. But sometimes you do need to step up and tell the other referees that we're doing things your way because it's your decision, and then you can talk about it more at halftime or at the end of the game. It's not fun, but anyone who's been in a leadership position, regardless of where, knows that this will come up if you do it long enough. The most important thing I can say is to allow it for future discussions. Sometimes we get things wrong, and that allows us to make the appropriate mea couples and adjustments. And if the person isn't any kind of jerk, they've been on the same end and will understand. I typically don't tell refs that I have to make decisions in 30 seconds like captains do, but sometimes it feels like it. Ultimately, the referee crew needs you to be the facilitator in reviews or just timeout discussions. You're the one that keeps the meeting focused and on topic. You also need to express confidence in the crew. If there's a captain who's constantly harping on a jam ref, but the jam ref is spot on, have a quiet word or three that they're nailing it. And if they're not, let them know what they need to do to nail it. If the description that the ref gave to the captain was good, reinforce that. Remind them that they'll probably be the target for the entire half, but that you were there to support them. One thing that I didn't mention as a requirement for head referees is an encyclopedic knowledge of the rules. If you got it, then sure, it'll help. But I was never good at dates in my history classes in school, and I love history. And I'm not good at rules numbers in the WFTDA rule set. But if I knew the context of the events of the history I was studying, and I think I have a handle on what the rules say, even if I couldn't tell you the date the Magna Carta was signed, or the rule number for declaring a forfeit, the glossary for head referee, I'm staring at it now. Since officials and other major decisions are often preceded by a meeting of referees, you can use the other referees' knowledge to supplement yours. Knowing the rules well yourself certainly helps, no matter what position you referee in, but it's not a requirement. Another thing I didn't include was where to position yourself. Contrary to popular opinion, you can head referee from the front IPR spot. However, before you do that, be sure that whoever is in the back actually knows how to ref from there. 
I saw at a tournament recently where the head ref was in the front, but the IPR had never been in the back before. And while I wouldn't call the game a disaster or even bad, there were a lot missed, and it did grind on the players. And while I know that there has to be a time and a place for everyone to do something for the first time, we need to think about when that best first time is. Therefore, I'd recommend that you at least be familiar with roughing in the back, even if you prefer to be in the front, just in case that's still the best place for you. Post-game is normally pretty straightforward. You sign the paperwork and start taking your gear off. It's possible you may have some post-game comments from the captains. If they're positive, suggest they put them on your evals. If they're negative, maybe you're able to talk out those issues. If it's something that becomes circular, which is possible because it's the end of the game, you can invite them to file a grievance with the game's review panel. In most cases, the best policy is to just not look for trouble. Remember that there are all the skaters, plus bench staff, third base coaches, and who knows what else. And just because most of them are happy doesn't mean all of them are happy. I tend to subscribe to the theory that our job of, as officials isn't done until we're out of the venue. Stay professional the whole time. Leave the track and go back to the officials area as soon as the final score is called official. By the time you get to the after party, usually everyone has calmed down by then. If you're worried about otherwise, I've seen an increasing number of unofficial after parties for officials. A chance to cool off with the refs and NSOs of the game before going to the official after party. If there are two skills to learn that are a necessity to being a good head referee, or at least to start being one, is the ability to empathize with the skaters and the ability to project a sense of calm in a crisis. One thing that doesn't get talked a lot about in roller derby referee classes is something known as selling the call. This is something that's talked a lot at soccer at high levels, and it's used to project an air of authority in a game that's pretty well known for being populated by a bunch of whingers and whiners. Take a look at the top head referees in the WFTDA, and you'll notice several things in common. Their penalty signals are slow and deliberate. None of this fast repetition of hand signals that make you look like you're on meth. They have an open body posture to skaters talking to them. They have eye contact and a very calm demeanor at all times. One thing I want to emphasize is that head refing is a skill like any other. Mistakes will be made. Don't beat yourself up over them. Just try to learn from them. And if you work at it, you will improve. Take the opportunity to ask skaters after the game is over what they liked and didn't like from you as the head ref. Remember that, among other things, you're serving as their liaison and you're asking them to trust you to do right by the game. And if they don't feel like you're doing it, you need to find out why in order to correct it. I'd like to thank the following photographers who have generously allowed their photographs to be used in this presentation. Quick and Derby, Corfan, Neil Gunner, Pre-Flash Gordon, and Donna Olmsted. If you found this presentation helpful, or think it or other presentations at refed.com might be helpful to others, please share this site. But please do not modify it or send it out without appropriate credit for its production. This presentation is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License.